My name is Olivia Leiter, and welcome to this presentation about tactile maps. What does it mean to be oriented? How do we come to find our way in the world? Maps help us understand the world around us and give us a sense of direction. Most maps are centered on sight. One of the earliest map making devices was the horizon line. Sailors used the horizon line to navigate the ocean. The sun's position to the horizon told them what time of the day it was and what direction they were sailing. What are the map making tools that we use to navigate our surroundings? Cartography. Cartography is the science of drawing maps. This is a world map from 1664. Coordinates. Coordinates are linear and or angular quantities that designate the position of a point in relation to a reference frame. Latitude. Latitude measures the north-south position between the poles. All of the red horizontal lines represent latitude. Longitude. Longitude measures the east-west position. All of the vertical red lines are longitude. Landmark. A landmark is a monument or fixed object that may be used to determine the location or direction in navigation. Grid. The grid is a network of evenly spaced horizontal and vertical lines used to identify locations on a map. Legend. The legend, also known as the key, explains what the symbols on your map represent. Compass. The compass indicates the cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. Scale. The scale indicates the ratio of a distance on the map to the corresponding distance on the ground. The scale tells you how much space your map covers. For instance, an eight and a half paper with a map of the world covers 10,000 miles, while the same size map of California covers 1,000, and the same size map of your home may only cover 25 feet, and the same size map of your hand would be the actual size. What do maps look like today? Today, we often use Global Position System Technology, or GPS, to navigate through space. An automated voice tells you where to go. When we follow GPS maps, we use hearing as well as sight. Because these directions are automatic, sometimes we follow them mindlessly. This is an image from a Waze map app that you would find on your phone. So what's a tactile map? Let's return to the function of maps. Maps help us understand the world around us and give us a sense of direction. Tactile maps are centered on exploring our environments through touch. We stare at our walls, carpets, and computers every day, but what do these materials feel like? Touching slows down the experience of moving through space and has the potential to make the familiar strange. A person who is blind can use a tactile map to help them navigate their surroundings. Think about navigating your surroundings through touch. In my apartment, the kitchen floor is made of smooth, cold, square ceramic tile. My living room 
has thick plush carpeting. The hallway to my bedroom has wooden floors. If I'm standing on soft, thick carpeting, I know I'm in my living room. If I'm standing on cool, smooth tile, I'm either in my kitchen or my bathroom. Animal Maps How do animals become oriented in space? How do animals know where to find food or how to get back home? Instead of using paper maps, animals rely on their senses to give them information about the space and surfaces around them. Bats rely on their hearing more than their vision to navigate through space. Snails are almost completely blind and deaf and use their heightened sense of smell to find food. Many insects use feelers or antenna to detect odors. Catfish are said to be the most finely tuned creatures on earth. Unlike most fish, they don't have scales, so their smooth skin gives them a heightened sense of touch. In addition, tiny hairs that run along the catfish's side are very sensitive to vibrations. So much so, catfish are rumored to be able to detect earthquakes days in advance. Bruce Nauman, Mapping the Studio in his video piece called Mapping the Studio, the artist Bruce Nauman records nocturnal activities of cats and mice in his studio. Now that we've looked at how animals use different senses to navigate through space, think about how humans might explore their environments through touch. Rubbings. Rubbings give us information about the textures of surfaces. When we create a rubbing, we make a map that is the actual size of the surface we are mapping. Grave rubbings were used to help people preserve records of their family history. Preserving family records helps us understand where we come from. Artists who make tactile maps. Consider the different ways these artists map their surroundings through touch. What materials are they using? Are they making their work at home, outdoors, in public? Many of these artists make rubbings of the objects and spaces around them. How do different types of drawing utensils and drawing surfaces affect the rubbings? Which rubbings feel more detailed? Which rubbings feel more abstract? Consider why these artists would want to explore their surroundings through touch. What might artists learn about their surroundings from creating rubbings, or in one case, from climbing around their apartment? Robert Overby. This piece is called Brown and Black Rubbings Number no. 3. It was made in 1972 and it's chalk on paper. Overby creates rubbings of walls, floors, and other architectural spaces. Overby treats these spaces as drawing surfaces, mapping their form and texture. Referencing, copying, and repetition are often themes in his work. Sam Falls. This piece is called Studio Floor, and it was made in 2012. Similar to Overby, Sam Falls creates rubbings of his floor and maps its texture. In an interview, Falls says, I am always trying to draw out the inherent qual qualities of time and make them visible. When Falls records the marks and traces on his floor, he maps how a surface changes over time. Jack Witten. This piece is called Studio Floor Number 1, made in 1970, 
made of carbon stick rubbing on paper. Jack Whitten is known for experimenting with different tools to create textured drawings and paintings. As you look at these works, think back to gravestone rubbings that document the texture and actual size of a surface. Katie Hershog. Rubbing the Internet Archive consists of a 10 foot high by 84 foot wide rubbing of the exterior of the Internet Archive building in San Francisco that Hershog made using rubbing wax on non-fusible interfacing. The Internet Archive is a digital library. Most of us don't think about the Internet Archive as a physical place. By creating this tactile map, Hershog reminds us that the images we look at online often come from a physical location. Heidi Boucher. This piece is called Borg. It was made in 1976. It's made of textiles, latex, mother of pearl pigments, and bamboo. Boucher creates three-dimensional maps of the spaces around her. She covers walls in gauze and liquid latex. Once the materials have dried, she peels off the surface. The surface becomes a skin, an extension of the body. While the previous artists map walls and other architectural spaces, these artists create rubbings of objects around them. Think about these rubbings as schematics, maps of the different components that make up a device or object. This is an example of an iPhone schematic. It helps us see the various parts and where they are located. Jennifer Bornstein. This is a wax crayon rubbing of a 16 millimeter camera. When Bornstein creates a rubbing of her camera, she makes a schematic, a map of all its various parts. She shows where each part is located on her camera. Doho Sa. This piece is called Metal Jacket. It was made in 2014. It's colored pencil on mulberry paper. Sa creates rubbings of Korean military supplies. These rubbings, similar to Jennifer Bornstein's camera rubbing, become schematics. Guides that help us understand the different components of an object. In this image, we are able to see the different forms and textures that make up the surface of a metal jacket. Sa actually served in the Korean military and has a personal relationship to the materials he's rubbing. Think back to grave rubbings and how they relate to memory, helping us understand where we come from. Through rubbing these military supplies, Sa reflects on his identity and experiences. Here are some other ways to map your movement through space. William Anatasi. This piece is called Subway Drawing. It was made in 2011 and it's ballpoint pen and pencil on paper. Anatasi makes these drawings while he rides the subway in New York. He puts a piece of paper on his lap and lets the subway move his pen along the paper. These drawings become maps of the subway's movement. This is a video still of Anatasi making one of his subway drawings in New York. These are called pocket drawings. They were made in 1969. In this piece, Anatasi folded sheets into eight squares making them small enough to fit into his pocket. As he walked, he held a tiny soft pencil against the exposed paper inside the cramped space of his pocket. The resulting marks graph his movement. Lucy Gunning, Climbing Around My Room. In her video, Climbing Around My Room, the artist Lucy Gunning moves through her apartment, trying not to touch her floor. She explores her space through touch.
climbing around and scaling the boundaries of her apartment. Let's start making our own tactile maps. We will use rubbings to create tactile, actual size maps of the surfaces around us. The following sections will introduce you to the materials, activity, and objectives. Materials. The first thing you'll need is a drawing surface. Look around your room and see what's available. Try to choose lighter colored surfaces so that you'll be able to see your tactile map. Here are some examples of drawing surfaces. The second thing that you'll need is a drawing utensil. Here are some examples of drawing utensils that you might find around your house. I would also recommend having some tape for this activity. Activity. The first thing that you want to do is explore your surroundings. Look for anything with an interesting texture, a door, a window, a keyboard, the floor, an air conditioner, a laundry basket. Next, choose a surface to map. Place a piece of fabric or paper on the surface. This is an example of me putting a piece of bed sheeting on my floor and then I'm taping it down so things don't move around. Finally, start mapping. I recommend using the side of your drawing utensil. Keep rubbing until you start to see different forms and textures. Apply more pressure to darken your map and make things more visible. As you're making your rubbing, think about maps as tools that help us understand the world around us. Imagine moving through space as a catfish with a heightened sense of touch feeling the vibrations and textures of the things around you. Once you've made your first tactile map, keep experimenting. Map different surfaces in your room. Try using different drawing utensils. Try using different drawing surfaces. Try mapping for longer periods of time. Listen while you're mapping. Do different surfaces generate different sounds? Try making tactile maps while closing your eyes or with the lights off. Here are some examples of tactile maps that I've created in my living room. Objectives. First, place your tactile maps next to each other. Describe your different maps. What types of patterns and shapes did you create? Write down a list of associations that you have when you look at your maps. Do they conjure a memory, a familiar place? If you used a variety of drawing utensils and drawing surfaces, write about how different materials generated different tactile maps. Next, Reflect on your experience making tactile maps. Did you find anything surprising? Challenging? What was your favorite part about making tactile maps? What did you learn about your surroundings? I hope you've enjoyed learning about maps and making your own tactile maps.